Great. Thank you so much. That's even better. Uh, so, um, I come from a slightly different community, but it's a good opportunity to discuss with all of you the dissipation phenomena that occur in these um, uh, nanoporous materials. But before I go into the subject of the matter, I would like to um, uh, point out other research lines that we are covering because that might give rise, so to say, to other interactions at lunchtime or so. So, uh, we um, also deal with uh, super hydrophobic surfaces. Um, uh, nano metal nanocluster with the final aim of, uh, so to say, studying the tribological properties at surfaces. And uh, interfacial sleep, uh, li both liquid solid and liquid liquid. But today I will talk about dissipation phenomena in nanoporous materials immersed in water. So, and I would like to spend some time in explaining what the system looks like. Um, and um, it is really a sort of um, granules of nanoporous materials. And uh, inside of each of these granules, there are billions of uh, pores. And uh, they're made hydrophobic by some tricks and then immersed in water. You can also use another non wetting liquid. Uh, and then uh, you can do pressure volume cycles in uh, this assembly, so in this sealed container, and uh, uh, plot out um, uh, curves similar to this. And what you see is that because of hydrophobicity, water enters into the pores only at relatively large pressure. So here in this special case is on the order of 50 megapascals. So you have this intrusion pressure. And on the other hand, once all uh, the nanopores are wet, uh, then in order to extrude water, uh, you have to form a new phase, and this generally occurs at lower pressures. And so uh, these two intrusion extrusion pressure define an hysteresis cycle, which of course gives rise to dissipation. And here dissipation is key because you can have an entirely different range of application depending on, um, on how much energy you dissipate per cycle. In particular, um, uh, you can have uh, vibration dampers uh, when you have a large but repeatable cycle. You can have uh, single-use shock absorbers, like in car bumpers, uh, when uh, you don't have hysteresis, uh, when you don't have extrusion, so you, you, you just dissipate energy once and then you throw away your system. So you dissipate once, but then you, you don't go back. Or you can tailor your system to have intrusion-extrusion pressure very close by, such that you can minimize energy dissipation and you can store energy in the form of interfacial energy and take advantage of the enormous surface area of these uh, pores, which can go from hundreds of square meters per gram to thousands of square meters per gram. And then uh, I added to the slide after the talk of uh, Alessandro Siria, also the fact that more recent application take into account electrotribology happening in this system because you can charge and discharge by intrusion, extrusion, um, these, uh, um, uh, the solid. But what is most striking um, actually is the extrusion process because it's like seeing boiling at uh, extreme pressures, so like at two or three megapascals. And this is, can be visualized, for instance, if you add um, uh, hydrophobic solutes. And the reason is that because of confinement, and because it's hydrophobic, uh, water fluctuations, or liquid fluctuation, if you wish, inside of these uh, pores is enhanced. And uh, let me repeat the video once uh, again. And um, so what happens is that really um, you shift uh, the pressure at which you can see boiling, or if you wish, drying. Um, by, um, um, by a great amount, and, and you can tune it. So the main question for today is, how do we control uh, wetting and drying, uh, uh, dissipation coming from wetting and drying hysteresis, and uh, in order to, uh, which in the end boils down to how you control boiling and confinement, and we have different ingredients we can play with. And today on the menu, uh, we have, uh, um, we, we will play with all of them. So uh, you can change the hydrophobicity, the size of the pores, the geometry, the topology, for instance, how much they are connected, 
and uh, uh, then you can uh, have different types of pores. So uh, molecularly defined or meso mesopores. And then you can play with pore elasticity. So uh, the computational but even experimental challenge of uh, these systems is that you're really dealing with uh, a mm, confined phase transition. So in order to go from the filled state to the empty state, you have to overcome a barrier which is typically larger than KBT. So you have two time scales, one of the microscopic dynamics and one which is a useless, so to say, waiting time before you overcome the barrier. So typically you have to use rare events techniques in order to accelerate sampling, but in this case, the collective variables, so the descriptors for the wetting or drying process are not um, trivial at all. So along the years, we have used uh, a version of umbrella sampling, or we have used the string method in collective variables, which allow you to, so to say, use much more general collective variables, their continuum equivalents, and now we're moving towards machine learned collective variables in which so to say, um, um, you don't have to guess what the variables are, but uh, they are automatically learned. So uh, let's try to, to have first a macroscopic idea of why drying occurs at all uh, in nanoscale confinement. And this is relatively easy because if you write down the free energy for um, a confined fluid, uh, you have a, a uh, a volume term, minus PV, and uh, mm, uh, a surface term, gamma A, where A is the area of this slit. And if you compare uh, the free energies for the capillary vapor and the capillary liquid, this gives rise to co the coexistence conditions. And this is really Kelvin Laplace, also known as Kelvin Laplace law, which tells you that if you have a hydrophobic contact angle, so theta young larger than 90, uh, you can see drying at positive pressures, so basically at pressures larger than the ambient pressure. Uh, uh, and this so has to do with hydrophobicity, but also with confinement. So this effect is larger uh, the more you confine your system. Okay, so these were the two first ingredients of our menu. Um, and uh, the other thing one has to keep in mind is that, once again, uh, drying is really a nucleation phenomenon in which you, you, you have to um, generate a, a bubble, and uh, thus you have the usual competition between bulk and surface terms, which gives rise to um, uh, a free energy barrier. You can see this as a signature, um, because in, if you do constant frequency experiments, so you, you cycle over intrusion and extrusion, uh, you see that the extrusion pressure depends on the frequency, or if you wish, on the time of your experiment, and also on the temperature. So you really have a thermally activated signature of this process. So uh, since we are so confined, we can give a look to the atomistic details, and that this was um, an all-atom simulation with tip for p water. And uh, uh, in order to, uh, uh, so to say, to drive the event and to measure the free energy, we used a coarse-grained, uh, as a collective variable, the coarse-grained density of the system, and. Uh, Basically, what we obtain is what is the most probable way in which a bubble forms inside uh, um, a cylindrical pore, uh, which occurs with an asymmetric formation of a bubble, which then forms a capillary neck, and this is the transition state, and then two symmetric menisci that move away towards the cavity mouth. Uh, so, but the most important bit is that we have the free energy profile. From this free energy profile, what we can see that there are strong deviations from microscopic observables, but moreover, we can uh, basically repeat the calculation different pressures and build virtual uh, intrusion-extrusion cycle to be compared with experiments. And uh, here is the most interesting part for this community. So, of course, depending on the frequency at which you, you drive your system, uh, you have different uh, different dissipation energy per cycle. Uh, 
And if you go very, very slow, of course, you dissipate less energy. And if you kick it hard, instead, you have uh, stronger, um, stronger, stronger hysteresis. Uh, the main point is that intrusion, per se, is as well an activated event. But you don't see it in experiments, because the, it's um, basically the nucleation bubble is so small, uh, sorry, uh, b because um, it has a very large critical volume, and so uh, very small differences in pressure are sufficient to um, accommodate for very different frequency. On the other hand, um, since the critical bubble for extrusion, so for the formation of, uh, um, uh, for, um, is very small, you have an extreme dependence of the extrusion pressure on, um, um, on uh, uh, the frequency. And uh, this, is, uh, this gives rise overall to a dissipated energy which scales with the logarithm of time. And uh, um, this, so to say, was known, wow, one sec, uh, was known also, uh, explains uh, experimental data for a variety of different porous uh, materials. Um, so now we come to a different a constructive uh, parameter that we can use in order to tune this uh, uh, dissipated energy, which is how pores are connected. So an experimental friend of ours came to us saying, look, we have uh, two materials. The one on the left uh, has semi-independent pores of uh, um, six nanometers. The one on the right in, uh, has roughly the same size, but the pores are interconnected. One exhibits extrusion, and one does not exhibit extrusion at all. Uh, uh, what is the explanation for that? So the nominal size is the same, but the behavior is entirely different. And so we made a spherical cow model for, um, uh, for um, these pores, one with independent pores and one with uh, uh, lateral cavities, which mimic, so to say, interconnection between uh, pores. And uh, what you see is that, indeed, one of the two uh, um, is able to close the cycle, so to uh, exhibit extrusion, and the other one not. And uh, if you want to understand this in, uh, so to say, hand-waving fashion, the reason is that the, the case on the right um, has very small hydrophobic pores, which are never wet. So even at high pressures, you cannot wet them. So it's like the main pore has a super hydrophobic surface rather than only a hydrophobic surface. And this favors the formation of the first bubble. So it's, it's able to decrease the free energy barrier for nucleating the first bubble from 150 kBT to 5 kBT. So uh, it really accelerates um, nucleation. And uh, well, um, our friend did not believe that this is an entirely general mechanism, so has nothing to do with water. So he repeated the experiments uh, with mercury. Mercury um, it's advantageous because you don't even need to uh, silanize the surfaces in order to, to have a non-wetting liquid. And so he, he used uh, these uh, model pores, which are cylindrical, MCM41, and these other pores, which are random. Uh, and uh, um, you see that, uh, quite unexpectedly, the regular pores have very large hysteresis cycle because they lack this uh, poor connections, whereas the random material, um, because of this poor connectivity, has an extremely uh, low hysteresis. So then we move to microporous materials, which in this community means that that one was silica, and this one instead is really molecularly defined. So it's it's a, a system uh, in which you, you have a, a crystalline structure in which you have embedded pores. Uh, so you're at scales that range from few uh, one nanometer below. And uh, th the main point is studying what happens if you have connections between these pores. So you have uh, a pore, the main pores of 1.5 nanometers and then smaller pores of uh, 0.7 nanometers. And uh, so uh, you can compute the pressure of intrusion and extrusion, and here comes the surprise. 
based on the previous result on mesopause, we expected these pores to be more hydrophobic because of this super hydrophobic argument. Here instead, we noticed that uh, the presence of lateral cavities can make these pores all the way from more hydrophilic to more hydrophobic. So more hydrophobic would be the case of uh, mesopores. Uh, the two lines are the reference uh, pores without connections, but you can also think of making them more hydrophilic. And the main difference is the length of the lateral cavities. So for long lateral cavities, the behavior is more hydrophobic, and for short lateral cavities, the behavior is more hydrophilic. And the reason for this qualitatively different behavior as compared to the mesopores is that water inside these, the subnanometric cavities connecting uh, the main pores forms a single file. So basically, what happens is that um, forming hydrogen bonds across these uh, connections is energetically favored um, for short pores, whereas it is progressively less favored for longer pores. So this is very, very different from microscopic prediction based on um, Kelvin Laplace law, which would say that there is no dependence whatsoever on the length of the pore, but just on the pore radius. And by the way, at this subnanometric pore radius, the pressure at which you expect in intrusion is, uh, is extremely high. So, um, so in the end, you have a finite probability of wetting the pores even for subnanometric pores of one nanometer, which is entirely unexpected based on microscopic grounds. So we, we very recently we started playing also with pore elasticity. The only thing that I want to tell here is that uh, if your porous materials is also elastic, there can be a counterintuitive effects because you would expect that since the pore shrinks, the intrusion pressure increases. Uh, but these porous materials are quite complex. And so for instance, in ZIF-8, we noticed that the opposite happens. So if the material is stiff, you have a higher intrusion and extrusion pressure. If the material is flexible, uh, instead it has a lower intrusion and extrusion pressure. And this is because elasticity also acts on the sort of saloon doors that separate the cages of these materials. So it's not just that the material compresses and the pores uh, shrink. Um, so in the end, uh, um, we, we can, so to say, play with these different elements, hydrophobicity, pore size, pore connectivity. We have to take care whether we have mesopause or micropause because very different regimes, so to say non-classical regime might apply to micropause, and pore elasticity to uh, control dissipation and go all the way from, uh, so to say, dissipative system to energy storage devices. This is a real system uh, with uh, um, almost no hysteresis. And micropores materials are really a nice playground to control these properties uh, in uh, an extremely um, uh, careful way. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude and saying that the exotic phase behavior in extreme confinement provides flexible and robust dissipation mechanism which can be driven by external parameters, so pressure, temperature, etc. But also that there's a large uh, design space to control these phenomena, uh, uh, which I have just said. And uh, uh, so to say, our perspective is now to try to learn from biology in which also, uh, which also has hydrophobic pores uh, at uh, nanometric and sub-nanometric um, levels in order to learn different things. For instance, how to play with a complex chemistry, how to, to, to propagate movement on long directions, and how to make a cooperative, uh, uh, so an emergent uh, behavior because of the a combination of different pores. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and collaborators.
also for keeping time so nicely. Uh, yeah, please. To have air in these channels before the water comes in, and does it mean that the air get compressed or does it get dissolved into the water? And also when you have nucleation of cavities, or do they, does the air in, dissolved in the water influence that process? Okay, thank you. That's a very good question. So um, in the general case, So, okay, so since you have a sealed container, you can realize this sealed container in different ways. The usual way is that you degas both the liquid phase and uh, the porous phase before putting them together and sealing them. So normally you have a controlled amount of air inside of it. Uh, but we're attempting to use air, so to say, as a means to favor nucleation. And uh, at high pressures, you always dissolve air. So, so to say, the experimental knowledge is that above, of, I think, five megapascal, you dissolve all air. But this still can help drying. And we have preliminary evidence that this happens. And the, the reason is this, because air can act as a nucleation site which further decreases the, um, the nucleation barrier for a new bubble. So air plays a role and it can help uh, also uh, controlling uh, uh, the extrusion pressure. So this can be controlled and it's a, a good parameter to play with. That's a great, great question. I have a sort of a clarification, may, maybe nice, but just to make, make, make clear, you have a contact angle that is larger than 90. You should expect uh, capillary drying, right? Yeah. And it's less than 90. You should expect capillary condensation. That's a, that's a first statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, for some, a, for a simple geometry. Yes. I have seen some talks that people are condensating bowels between a hydrophobic AFM tips. So that's a, it's not what you would expect, right? Uh, no, this is not what you expect, but still a geometry plays a role, right? Because um, in the end, it's a competition uh, between bulk terms, but and then you have uh, surface costs for the liquid vapor interface, and then you have an interfacial advantage in case you have a hydrophobic thing. So uh, it, it, you really have to do the calculation on a specific geometry in order to answer to your, to, to, to your question. So, here, everything is simple because it's a slit, and you can do it analytically. But in general, it depends on uh, the geometry and on the curvature. So if your is hydrophobic and your surface is hydrophobic? I guess so. I didn't look into the problem, but I guess so, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is there any uh, specific lens, lens scale lens scale for the pore that uh, the, the fluid could not uh, the previous slide, I think? Okay, so this is a macroscopic law that tells you that basically... Uh, for, for molecular dynamic simulation, have you tried different pore, pore size to, to see? Yeah, yes, yes. So th this is what we're currently exploring. So the microscopic loss uh, tells you that it is, uh, so to say, uh, um, more difficult as 1 over L to intrude the pore, which is hydrophobic. But then we saw some counterintuitive result, which is the one that I showed you in the last slides, that even for uh, extremely sub-nanometric pores, you can um, put water in. And the reason is that water forms hydrogen bonds, so they can organize also in a single file. And uh, of course, uh, you cannot go below some threshold because you have steric hindrance. And so basically, uh, the water molecule cannot enter. But for these uh, sub-nanometric pores, you, you can still see water entering and at, ex at ambient pressure. So basically, uh, completely defying these, um, uh, the macroscopic expectation.
when you mentioned the, the effect of elasticity, mm -hmm. um, you, you sort of suggested that elasticity would be reduced to some shrinkage of the pores. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, why? I mean, uh, if you increase pressure, also pores should expand rather than compress, right? Okay, so it's, it's the, wait a sec. So this is, would be the image below. So uh, as long as the pores are dry, what you're doing is um, an hydrostatic compression of the material. And so in this case, you expect the pores to shrink. No, 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 that's the point, Nicole. So if you have uh, the pores that are dry, inside you have vapor. No, no, it's not at the same pressure. It depends on, uh, on the chemical potential, but basically uh, you can imagine that inside you have the vapor pressure at that temperature. So this is fixed and you keep increasing the, 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 the liquid pressure. So the delta P increases. So you don't have the same pressure. And then what happens is, and this is uh, what we publish in this paper, is that at some point you trigger the transition, so you wet the pores, and at this point you release all capillary energy and this expands again. So this is why it gives rise to an enormous negative compressibility, because you, you, you compress it and then it, and it, it springs back to, to the initial thing. So that, that's why I say it compresses, because as long as you have vapor inside, you, you can compress it. And then, of course, if you have the same phase in and out, nothing uh, spectacular happens. Thank you again. The next presentation is uh, online, so hopefully it will work. So it's uh, on... Walk on my...